glad to do that. And um, after I heard that you were there, I thought that it would be nice to have a separate event in which it would be possible to uh, talk in some more detail about um, his work and some of re recent ideas, but particularly through the angle of um, sort of approaching the past uh, through different ways, imaginative ways as well, um, for historians, for people who are working with uh, particularly the socialist past and so on. So this is how um, the event came together. And I started talking about it um, to friends, and then friends mentioned actually that uh, perhaps it would be an interesting um, location to um, actually have this event take place at TLCs, which seems to be one of the um, natural uh, sort of locations for such conversations. And then um, I was uh, glad to meet uh, Nikolai in this context um, as well. So we um, sort of decided to have to to have this uh, as a kind of open and open conversation of encounter, but also a possibility to hear um, Ilya Trajanov read from um, one of his recent pieces that um, actually deal with um, one of the themes of his work, which um, has to do with the history of surveillance. But I'm going to just say a few things first um, about um, his work being actually quite nervous about it because I think one of the things that I really like about about his work is the idea that he somehow resists identification. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but what inspires me about it is that in some ways it is a work that performs identity but actually resists identification and, and even the theme of uh, discussing the history of surveillance and totalitarian regimes and the history of surveillance today is one of the, for me, one of the um, upshoots in some ways of this, of this um, this idea that we're constantly forced to be identified somehow through some biography or through some particular pigeonholing, and yet we need to find ways of resisting this. So I'm actually kind of nervous in sort of giving any kind of form to what is a very rich, very multi-faceted um, creative sort of project. But I'm just going to say a few indications. So he comes from uh, Bulgaria, but came as a child, uh, moved with his family as a child, first to Germany, then... Um, sorry, just to correct you, we sorry. fled. We fled. Fle Fled, oh sorry, not moving. Fled, <laughs> Already a correction. <laughs> exactly. So fled um, from uh, Bulgaria through Yugoslavia and Italy to um, to Germany. But then uh, shortly after this, they moved to um, uh, Kenya, to Nairobi, where his father worked as an engineer. Um, and uh, you spent most of uh, your life at this period in Nairobi, but then um, uh, moved also to uh, uh, to um, uh, well, a school, boarding school, right in Bavaria. So you, your childhood was spent between Kenya and Bavaria, um, and then you lived in Paris, Bombay, Cape Town, <coughs> perhaps some other um, places, Munich as well, um, and um, uh, and now lives in in Vienna. Um, and perhaps uh, just to mention a few of the um, well, the, the books that that are going to be discussed, some of the most significant works that we are going to be perhaps touching on. Um, today. So his current most recent work that he completed in London is called Power and Resistance and will be forthcoming with Fischer um, in, in Germany. But perhaps the best known work among English speaking audiences would be The Collector of Worlds, uh, Weltensammler, um, which came out in 2006 um, and which charts the life of um, Richard Burton's colonial, um, a British colonial civil servant who um, sort of, um, I, I think that's, I mean, that's one of the, I, I mean, some. Um, some kind of readers' digests describe this as a uh, as the work that describes his assimilation in different cultural worlds. But uh, I would imagine that you would perhaps resist that description. That he's not a he's not a civil or, administrator who or, or assimilates his lack, or, his lack. or his lack of assimilation in different. Um, but uh, but anyway, he he traces the life of this very interesting character, Richard Burton, uh, through uh, multiple worlds, principally though India, Arabia, um, and eventually he ends up in Italy. East Africa. In East Africa and, um, um, and, um, and in Italy. Um, and then there's a kind of parallel book actually to this, um, which is a story of you tracing the work of Burton. Right? It's a sort of documentary, a sort of a different version in some ways of, of that plot, but it seems to be a story that, um, in which you explore how you explore Burton. It's sort of a double, uh, a double to this work it's, itself, which I found extremely um, Fascinating. Um, and then uh, the third book I would like to mention is um, called Hundertseiten, or in English, um, Dog Times, time, The Time of, of Dogs, A Time for Dogs, um, possible, multiple possible translations. Um, I suppose a, a book about uh, perhaps the most uh, autobiographical book. Um, no, 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 is it not? It's not at all autobiographical. No. <laughs> um, but it's, I mean, it's a book that in which you return to post totalitarian 
Bulgaria and through conversations with multiple um, personalities, including dissidents of different positions in this in this world, we sort of explore that in this world. And again, a kind of reassemblage, for me anyways, a reassemblage of, um, of worlds through the image of return, um, of, of the return. Um, and um, uh, among these um, works of um, fiction uh, documentary explorations um, is also um, a sort of parallel or entangled perhaps um, life as a civil civic activist as a kind of um, uh, representative of the um, well of humanity so <laughs> um, and I think that the theme of surveillance that you'll be reading about today um, provides perhaps a bridge between this this role that that I see as of the writer as a kind of world maker world collector and the writer as a spokesperson for ideas of freedom human rights um, um, and uh, we thought that this would provide a very interesting bridge for our conversation here about this question of approaching the past um, particularly the socialist past today sort of what motivates perhaps different people to explore different aspects of the socialist past particularly for example in this case the the history especially of um, uh, the nomenclature the surveillance experience of it uh, from today's point of view today when we are located in this room which for example has these uh, tiny and almost imperceptible apparatuses of observation but which we can also voluntarily perhaps resist this by having our own um, our own self-controlled observation like the live streaming device that we are um, that Nikolai has set up here so that there's a kind of very interesting change of course technological change that has happened various other changes that happen today but uh, but I think these changes, they kind of introduce us, um, well, it introduces us to different new optics for revisiting the past um, and optics both in the kind of methodological sense and in the literal sense of, uh, you know, this world in which we have different optical and other devices for observing life also gives us different cognitive life devices, I think, for approaching this, this past. So we were hoping that um, we would begin with this reading um, and then we will start a conversation and see sort of how it goes and perhaps we hear also from, um, from all of you in some ways what brings you here. So you, what happens will ultimately not be scripted, I suppose, but we will see how it evolves from the natural flow of the rest of our conversation. So um, over to you and we'll pass on to you. Well, thank you very much for that. Good afternoon or is it good evening? Um, good evening. Um, well, just give, to give you a little bit of context, the, the novel that, that you just mentioned um, is the result of um, 20 years of research. And um, I would actually call it, if, if I had to kind of give it a, a genre description, I would call it a oral history novel. Because what I did is I spent these 20 years um, talking to people who had been um, in jail during communist times, people who had been in the, uh, in the camps, especially in one, uh, in two big camps, one in, um, on an island in the Danube called Belenet, the other one in um, the place near Lovic in northern Bulgaria. Um, making a documentary film for German television, writing articles about it, and basically collecting testimonies, collecting testimonies sometimes um, in a written form, sometimes with the camera, sometimes um, in, in audio. Um, and the reason I was forced to do that is, is a very simple one. I think that might interest some of you. The reason is that, as in many Eastern European countries, the access to the archives, of uh, to many archives, um, is still very difficult. And to the archives of the Secret Service, um, it's a long and complicated story. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but there was um, there's, there has been an ongoing both debate and fight as to how and who and in what way controls the archives of the former Secret Service. And um, so basically because I, as anybody else, I, I did not have complete access to the archives. Uh, many other archives, by the way, are um, totally inaccessible until this day. Um, I was forced to take this other route, and um, so the the testimonies of, of the so-called victims, which I do not portray in my novel as victims, um, but of the political prisoners, was far easier than 
the other perspective, the perspective of the apparatchiks, of officers, officers of the Secret Service. In all these years, I only managed to interview three of them. And these three conversations were not interesting in terms of the information I gathered, but they were interesting in terms of the rhetoric of self-justification, um, the language, the, the positioning, the uh, subjective morality of the three people I, I spoke to. Um, so all this research went into, into a novel that actually uses Secret Service documents um, and places them in, in a fictional narrative. So what I'm doing is I'm basically blurring the, uh, the boundaries between the documentary and uh, the fictional um, with, a, with a result that I think is very interesting because the one thing one notices as an author, and I think it will be probably more uh, perceptible to readers is that the documents read very differently and are perceived very differently when they're um, set in a, in a fictional um, framework. And um, otherwise, the novel is basically uh, consists of four narrative um, levels the voice of a former political prisoner called Constantine, the voice of a former, former um, officer of the Secret Service, a Paratchik, um, later on member of the new oligarchy um, called Metodi. So for Bulgarians, the irony is evident, um, Konstantin and Metodi. Um, the, the third um, level are documents from the Secret Service archives that were given to me by some of the political, former political prisoners that I interviewed with the understanding uh, that I was allowed to use them freely in whatever way I wanted to. And the third level is a level of the, as, as we say in German, Zeitgeist, um, kind of narrating the, the era or the year in which the, um, the narrative is set. So this is just the, the framework. I'm going to read a short text which um, kind of explains to you the, the political and autobiographical motivation for, for this work. Why, why was I so interested in portraying the, the communist and post-communist past? Why do I think, um, why do I strongly believe that it not only has a universal resonance, but it has a very, very contemporary aspect? Um, and after that, I think we can, we can you know, stop, as we, as we suggested, we can uh, start just having an open discussion. Now, this was translated by somebody else into English, so um, I actually just got it an hour ago, so I might stop and correct something on the way. Uh, it's called Security or Freedom, the False Premise. Number one. For years now, a supposedly rational discourse is being cultivated in Europe and North America regarding the balance between freedom and security. Hardly a public discussion, political speech, or critical newspaper column that disputes the truism that a balance has to be struck between these two values. While the weight attached to each one of them varies considerably, there seems to be little doubt that current developments are essentially the consequence of a rational, carefully considered balancing of social and individual needs. This could not be further from the truth. In fact, a completely new logic prevails. It is just that those who participate in the debate, in as far as they say anything at all, express themselves and frame the discourse using old, established paradigms. Number two. When I was a child, our cramped flat in Sofia was bugged as part of a grand technical operation. It was upon the suggestion of the director of the third subdivision of the second department of the sixth directorate of the Bulgarian Committee for State Security, an officer named Pantelev, that a series of microphones was installed in our flat in order to gather evidence for the strategic investigation into the object of suspicion known as G.K.G, my uncle. The action was carried out on a sunny day in spring for the purposes of which all residents were removed for several hours from our building, which housed several families. My uncle's boss was instructed to send my uncle on a business trip. 
One security agent was, was to confirm that he boarded the train as planned. Another one to confirm that he disembarked from the train at the correct destination. The caretaker of the house was informed of the plan and instructed to provide a list of the residents, 17 names in total. My aunt and my grandmother were summoned to the Ministry of Interior, where they were waiting for a very long time. Our neighbors on the floor below us, named Trevenovi, which um, translates as the Reds, were called in for protracted meetings at the local popular front office in rec recognition of their conformity with the system. A pensioner named Stumbover was invited to a pensioner's club where an employee of the Secret Service was to observe her just in case she decided to make her way home earlier than expected. In this way, each resident was removed so that the task force from the fourth department, which was responsible for installing microphones, five men in total, could force their way into the flat. Meanwhile, two further agents maintained contact with the control room. Positioned before the front door was a protection and surveillance unit of three additional men who could reach all the other units involved by radio and coordinate any measures to be taken should unexpected guests approach. Simultaneously, the Office of State Security in the provincial town of Bragoevdrat was instructed to observe my uncle's parents in case they made a surprise visit to Sofia. Lastly, an order was given to the Noise Management Unit, which is actually named Noise Management Unit. It's um, like from a Monty Python sketch. So the Noise Management Unit was instructed to be active until the microphones were successfully installed. In total, 24 employees of the Bulgarian Secret, Secret Service were involved in this operation. Number three, concepts of security and freedom are so variable that they cannot really be forced into the same equation. Security is a project that, and this is the one thing on which everyone agrees, can never reach completion. There is no such thing as absolute security. This is repeatedly em em emphasized in order to lower citizens' expectations. Security, therefore, is about a real and insoluble lack. We are never secure enough. There's always more we could do for our security. The only thing that is certain is that nothing is certain, and so on and so on. In contrast to which, freedom is a basic state, at least according to the ideals of enlightenment. People are born into freedom. Of course, state, religious, and other constraints limit this in, uh, in uh, oh, oops, sorry, I lost my way, limit this inalienable right, but as they say, if we don't let them, then no one can take it away from us. In political sciences, complex theories are developed to explain why, in spite of their freedom, individuals must always bow to the dictates of the state. In theory, freedom is, for most of us at least, the essence of the individual, whereas security is one of society's goals, one among many. As such, freedom and security are not comparable with one another, and the demand for one to be limited in favor of the other is conceptual nonsense. But what does philosophy matter when terrorism lurks outside the front door? Instead of talking about freedom and security, it would be more honest to speak of fear and control. In the wake of the recent attacks in Paris, just to give you one example, the Viennese daily newspaper, Der Standard, ran with the headline, Freedom Requires Security. But in the text, it never spelled out the statement's perfidious logic. Freedom requires security, which means freedom requires eavesdropping, which means freedom requires handcuffs, which means we don't need freedom. A more precise and honest formulation would be fear calls for control. Number four. Our apartment in Sofia was bugged at the beginning of the 1970s. In comparison, it would require laughably few resources to accomplish the same today. If those subject to surveillance used mobile phones and computers that access the internet, with a few keyboard commands and a few clicks, 
Our family of six would become digitally transparent. We don't have to consider a hypothetical scenario such as this. It is happening today, right now, in countless apartments around the world. And yet, the old-fashioned scenario in Sofia that I just referred to is probably more shocking to most of us. This classic mixture of deception, coercion, and state conspiracy, the blatant infringement of people's private sphere by force, against which there is evidently no protection. In view of which, today's more perfidious, invisible intrusion, intrusions and attacks merely leave most of us, many of us, depending on which country, cold. There are two stickers on the doors of Vienna's underground trains. One is green and it depicts a security camera. The other is blue and it depicts an infant's pram. The statement is clear and simple. We would like to stress that you would be subject to surveillance from cradle to grave. This much everyone will in inevitably understand who has paid even the slightest attention to the media revelations and discussions over the course of the last two years, during which almost every serious article on this subject highlighted the virtually limit limitless extent of possible or actually practiced surveillance. However, within the same time frame, the emphasis in public discourse shifted noticeably. The existence of mass surveillance is no longer disputed, as it was several years ago when I published a book with my colleague Yuli Tsi, and uh, many accused us of um, exaggeration, accused us of being hysterical. That was in the year 2009. Uh, funnily enough, a few years later, they accused us of underestimating the threat. We now know that the NSA, not only the NSA, but above all the NSA, surveys between three to four billion people, that is, every citizen on the planet who's digitally active. We know that it is nigh on an impossible to escape the surveillance, even if we encrypt our communications, since those programs available on the mass market, at least, contain small back doors to which the security services can enter just like the Ottomans once gained entry to Constantinople under the cover of night. But no one disputes any longer the extent to which data is gathered. What is discussed instead is whether or not this kind of authoritarian control causes any damage. The debate tends to prompt a search for individual innocent victims, as if the outdated perception of repression implied would accord with anything that the general population was capable of imagining. The damage caused to society as a whole is, by contrast, disregarded to the same degree as the current paradigm change. Fifth. In capitalism, no one would be so stupid as to endanger a successful business model with reasonable or even idealistic arguments. According to an investigation in 2013, the annual turnover of the global security industrial complex totaled 415.53 billion US dollars and is expected to continue to rise. A turnover of 544 billion US dollars was forecast for 2018. In times of slow economic expansion, such rate of growth is breathtaking. And since profit is the oxygen of the dominant of the ruling system, everyone will understand why we should refrain from polluting our air with too much freedom. Consequently, the quality controls that are otherwise so widespread hardly apply in the security sector, if at all. There is no method until now whatsoever for assessing whether the control mechanisms introduced during recent years have brought us any closer to achieving more security. While every food product carries a detailed description of its nutritional values, it suffices to whisper foiled terrorist attack whenever security is concerned. <coughs> if inve investi investigative journalists were to subject such claims to closer scrutiny, it would become apparent that they concern only a few isolated cases, most, most of which are uncovered by chance or using the traditional methods of police work. 
assuming that is that such cases have not been largely enacted by undercover agents, as has happened on multiple occasions. One of the interesting things in comparing the secret service work during the communist times and the contemporary one is that although technology has been revolutionized, has completely changed, there are, there are actually many aspects that have remained the same. And one of them is that there is always an enormous influence of the undercover agent. And many of the cases that I'm aware of, both in communist Bulgaria and in contemporary anti-terrorism, are in some way at least manipulated, if not even driven by such undercover agents. The efficient, efficiency of anti-terrorist programs is never evaluated, even though a number of former employees of the security and secret service apparatus, not, not least the NSA legend William Binney, have openly questioned whether total surveillance is not, in fact, counterproductive. The principles of the rule of law that are supposed to protect us are overridden by the knockout argument par excellence, national security. There was actually in the um, London Review of Books, there was a very interesting article, I think last week on Eric Hobsbawm, I don't know whether anyone read it, because the uh, Secret Service files on him until 1964, because there's always a 50-year uh, kind of, um, 50-year ban on, on, on accessing them. So the, the files until 64 have now been published, and quite a number of them are retracted, and uh, the only explanation given is that they still concern aspects of national security. So this is, again, this is something which has been used by, for example, the state in post-communist Bulgaria, as well as in the US, in Germany, in England, wherever. Um, once you have the national security argument, you can basically retract and bury any embarrassing, unpleasant, or even criminal information that you wish to. Anyone who claims to control everything is no longer subject to any control whatsoever. I think this is very important because um, one of the things that I find paradoxical um, is that if one were to assume that the only way we can be reasonably secure as a society is if there's complete control, then I think logically the next question would have to be who controls those who are doing the controlling. So unless we had a circular system of control, which includes the control, the, the so control by the society of those who control, um, there's no kind of uh, logical consistency in, in this particular argument. And there's one exception, a very interesting exception, which has been discussed the last few months in the US, and that is that police officers will have to wear a camera. I don't know whether you've heard of that. They have to wear a camera on their helmet, which in a way would be a first step of what, I call, as far as I know, the first step towards giving society at least a small instrument of control over uh, state officials. Complete anonymity where the state is concerned, complete transparency when it comes to the citizen, citizens. This is the thrust of what's being called for at the moment. There is a decisive error of thought in this attempt at legitimation. Whoever has this kind of trust in the positive effects of total surveillance would have to take this approach to its logical end. And this is what I described just now. This is, I think, the end of what I wanted to read you, just as a small, just as a small introduction to my thinking and um, to the to one aspect which to me is very important, and that is um, what can a contemporary society learn from the um, from the secret service and the repressive apparatus of um, the communist past. And um, it's something that needs to be discussed because uh, my position is um, one amongst many, even within these circles that lo look into these issues. Just to give you one example, I've been having a, quite a heated discussion with um, a German author called Hertha Müller, who you might know 
who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, who comes from uh, Romania and whose lifelong work basically is uh, looking at the repressive structures and the effects it has on uh, the emotional uh, and the mindset of um, the citizens, especially on herself. Um, she, for example, believes that um, because no one is arrested at three o'clock in the morning with, without any reason, uh, which in itself is debatable that we cannot actually speak of a surveillance state. So this is the point I was trying to make that she's using to, according to me, a very old paradigm that is a certain imagination or a certain, certain restricted imagination of what repression is and is not willing to expand this to include a omniscient or encompassing surveillance that I think has um, has a lot of very, very negative um, aspects that we will we have yet to learn about, that we're at the moment not aware of. Just to give you one example, I've been um, very active in kind of drumming up support um, against surveillance. So one of the things I did with four colleagues of mine was to um, formulate a international petition, Authors Against Mass Surveillance, which was published in 30 newspapers in 30 countries and in, in England on the front page of The Guardian. And we had um, 800 authors from 80 states who, who signed it. Interestingly enough, nearly every author we approached signed it. So there seems to be a kind of sensitivity amongst authors, uh, a greater sensitivity amongst authors than amongst other um, professional groups. Um, the interesting thing was that um, when we were, after, after that, um, after that project, um, or after that kind of um, activity, the, the, pen, the PEN in the US uh, sent out a questionnaire to its members, trying to find out whether um, the way they communicate, the way they write, has changed since the revelations of Snowden. And it was absolutely shocking to hear that 25% of the um, authors, essayists, novelists, journalists organized in, in the PEN America admitted to being more careful when they communicate and admitted even to shying away from certain themes in regard to their own work which might get them into trouble. Um, and another very interesting thing which we might discuss since we're also talking about in the aspect of, or we should be talking about the aspect of research because it's um, I think um, similar problems will come up for both authors and scientists, historians, is that I met the, the leading um, German investigative, um, or one of the leading journalists in, um, at the Frankfurt Book Fair last year. And she said something very interesting. She said she's having a hard time um, finding whistleblowers, because as a journalist, that was one of the main uh, sources of her work, um, because she can no longer perceivably guarantee anonymity. Because amongst whistleblowers who are, in, in that case, well-informed professionals, there's a general understanding that it would be close to impossible for such a journalist, even if she were to um, do everything very professionally, to safeguard the information, to, be, to, to absolutely guarantee the anonymity which many of them require or insist upon. Um, so she's saying that there's now um, a very, very, um, for her, a very, very threatening lack of, um, of kind of freedom of expression, of, of freedom of expression amongst anonymous sources, which, as you all know, um, is a very, very important part of the um, of journalism. So these are just a few thoughts and a few kind of aspects um, that. Um, that have informed my work, which is, as you um, mentioned, is both um, fictional and, and non-fictional, and it is uh, sometimes a, a mixture of both. Well, thank you very much. I'll just open the conversation with a few, um, I don't know, first questions. I mean, one of the things that I would like to know in some ways is like among the different hats we can all wear, um, the hat of the imagination maker or the person who inspires imagination. I mean, 
Why, why do you think our writers are so um, active? I mean, writers like Yuli Tseen, you mentioned who wrote the book with um, Hertha Müller and others. Um, so why specifically are writers so active in mobilizing sentiment about about surveillance? And specifically, is there a divide? Um, you've been a member of the PEN for 10 years. Probably longer, like but yeah. Longer, yeah. Um, I mean, is there some kind of divide between writers who had some direct experience of, of life under communist rule, however we define it, um, and those who don't, in terms of responding, how they respond to this issue of surveillance now, specifically. So is there, is there I mean, whether it's a generational divide or a divide by geography somehow, I don't know, but um, is there a sense of there are kind of separate conversations actually happening there? Well, there, there are. I mean, amongst the, um, I mean, interesting, um, another very interesting voice is uh, Liao Yi Wu, um, who's a Chinese who spent quite a number of years in, in the Chinese Gulag, who now lives in, in Berlin. And um, I think those people who have, like Hatha Miller, like Liao Yi Wu, and many others who have experienced the, the repressive reality of a communist rule, um, are, of course, comparing <coughs> everything that's happening today directly with their own experiences. So I think there, um, there's a certain there's a certain fallacy there to, to maybe um, overestimate the repressive um, energy of the known totalitarian system and to underestimate the repress repressive energy of our contemporary system. That is one thing I noticed. Um, I think the problem is that we have in Germany, I don't know about England, but in Germany we have a taboo and that is you're not allowed to compare anything any contemporary issue with the totalitarian past. You're not allowed, in any case, you're not allowed to compare anything with Nazism, because that's unique in itself. Um, so whenever someone does that, you usually get spanked or you get caught. Um, you know, you're a right-wing um, moron, basically. And the other thing you're not allowed to do, you're not allowed to compare the two totalitarian systems, because you know that would kind of be unfair to the unique brutality of Nazism. And the third thing you're not, you're not allowed to do, you're not allowed to compare what's happening now with surveillance with what the Stasi, for example, is, with the East German Secret Service, um, which I find very, very bizarre, because at the same time, when we when you speak about the culture of remembrance, uh, what we're taught, at least every time a politician has to make a speech on, on one of the memorial days, is that we have to learn from history. You know, that is the, the main kind of rhetorical phrase of um, our attentiveness towards history. And, uh, you know, the old phrase, this should never be repeated again, we have to learn from history. But how are we going to learn from history if we don't compare certain aspects, for example, of anti-democratic, repressive um, surveillance of old with the one which is now happening? Because I think just by comparing, we could, by seeing the differences, by seeing the, the paradigm shift, by seeing technological and legal differences, we could gain a clear understanding of what is happening now. I think it's, it's one of the intellectual, um, rational instruments that we have to, to gorge what is happening at the moment, which is very, very difficult because it's something which is dramatically unfolding as we speak. So um, even for someone like myself, who's kind of specialized in this subject for the last four or five years, it's very, very difficult to keep up to date. And whenever I have a discussion in Germany with the Chaos Computer Club, I notice that I'm, I'm, I'm woefully undereducated. Because I mean, just you know, if, if we the Chaos Computer Club, just to explain, the Chaos Computer Club is the leading um, organization in Germany of, of hackers who are kind of legal hackers within the uh, framework of the constitution, who are politically active in, in basically informing the public as to the threats not only of surveillance but also the threats of new technology um, um, on, all, on all levels. And so they often do certain very kind of um, pronounced, they, they give out pronounced statements and then they, they do certain experiments so that the general public can see where the threat lies and what the difficulties are and so forth. And they're all kind of big time computer geeks. I mean, they're like, so, you know, if, if, you, if you tried to understand what was possible um, just last week, and you met them next week, they would explain to you that, you know, old stuff now, and then they tell you the most amazing thing. One of the interesting things is that 
if you speak to people who really know their technological stuff, you realize that we, all of us, even someone like myself, who's tried to understand what is happening, is very, very, in, in my thinking in, and in my imagination, I'm very, very old-fashioned. I'm kind of, I'm, I, I don't have the capacity, and as I, I think hardly anyone has, except for the real specialists, to understand both the technological reality of what is happening, as well as the social repercussions of this new technological reality. It's, it's very, very complex, and one would need a lot of both uh, competence and um, imagination and, and forward thinking. Um, so this is part of the problem, that the, the, the threat is not only to most people invisible, but also highly complex. And therefore, it's much, much easier to understand the old-fashioned threat of someone locking you up or someone hitting you with a police platoon or something like that. But at the same time, so you're talking about the technology, understanding the technologies, what is actually possible in the absence of evidence because of the secret services, the nature of the secret service operation, that they always remain unknown and untraceable. Yeah. And that's a big problem. I mean, obviously, it's a full story. Well, to, give you, to give you one but, example, I yeah. thought until recently that if I switched off my mobile phone, I was okay. Now they told me just a few weeks ago that I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm medieval. That actually doesn't matter. Even if you switch it on, they can now. They can still, yeah. But at the same time, but you as a writer, you are uh, still ultimately you are also concerned with understanding how people think and what they feel and what makes them look for things. I suppose. I mean, some of these. I mean, who is doing the surveillance? Why, what are they looking for? If you like, or, uh, things like that. But has that also changed with the technology? Would you say? I mean, is the kinds of things that the mind of the surveyor surveillance person works for the system it look is looking for is it now different than it was perhaps well, you see that, that is something that is something i cannot analyze so, so the question which always pops up is as a writer why are you writing non-fictional um, or journalistic texts in regard to the current threat and why are you turning to fiction when i'm looking at the past because i've got this new novel about a communist and post-communist bulgaria and the reason is very simple, that I, I, I am incapable of analyzing what you just asked, the, the kind of the, the mental framework of the contemporary citizen in all aspects in regard to this technological uh, paradigm shift. What I can do is, the past gives me kind of a certain um, leeway to, to fictionally develop um, both a narrative and, and, uh, and to analyze it. So um, when I look at, even if it's, if it's a recent past, when I look at the past, I can do all that. I can look at individuals and all aspects of their thinking, um, their emo emotional framework, and their actions. But in, in, in contemporary terms, I'm actually at loss. I'm, I'm groping my way through semi-darkness, which is why I think I cannot do more than just like journalistic work. And why, I mean, why the semi-darkness? I mean, couldn't you also do in some ways oral history with contemporary? I mean, no, you can't because point. absolutely no one knows what, what's happening and what, what they're doing. So to, who are you going to interview? It's quite the opposite. You, act, you, you actually speak to politicians, you realize they don't have a clue. You speak to people in the ministries, you realize they don't have a clue. So you actually, you're speaking to, and those who probably have a clue, which I'm, I hope they have a clue, let's say top-notch NSA people or in Germany, BND or and so on and so forth, they wouldn't, they wouldn't talk to you. So, so the problem is that it, it, it is semi-darkness, it's kind of a, yeah. So I have a couple of questions, before, if that's okay. Um, I really quite like the, the distinction between the different kinds of repression that you talked about, the personal kind of very Soviet style of get out of the house, let's bug it, like I imagine enormous like devices, and then the new kind. And what I was thinking is that, you mentioned the cameras that police officers have to wear, and now in South Carolina. Well, not yet. They're suggesting. It. Yeah, in South Carolina, that's happening now because now that there is evidence that that man was shot uh, by the police officer. And what I was thinking is, the Black Lives Matter, if I can say, this movement has been going on, and it's now reaching yeah. a sort of like an important moment because there is actual video evidence. So in this case, the surveillance is working the other way around, as 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 actual fact, and that's changing a very deep cultural thing in, in, in the United States. Yeah. And I was thinking in terms, if that's happening now, and if you can use social media and the internet and, and actual digital media outlets who are 
making it accessible to the world. What about, you know, what about the, the socialist past? How do you, because it's past and because it's so isolated and because nobody has access, how do you, how do you make that transition? How do you get people who are born after 89 to have an interest? Because studies show that they, they don't know, like in Bulgaria. They, yeah, they don't know. They don't care. Um, well, just to, to, to confirm what you're suggesting, I, I had a discussion with the editor of my Bulgarian publishing company because they're eager to bring out the novel in Bulgarian as soon as possible. So I was talking about the novel and I, I mentioned Lovic and she looked at me and I realized that she'd never heard of, I mean, she'd heard of the city, but not yeah. the camp. So I said, you've never heard of the, 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 labor, uh, camp, yeah. the labor camp? And she said, no. And this is a well-educated person who's actually also studied in, um, I think, history in Oxford. So um, above, um, you know, above um, your normal Bulgarian young yeah. person. Um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I remember speaking to students at the university in uh, Russia, mm -hmm. and um, most of them couldn't explain to me what the Politburo was. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 shocking. I think what literature can do to give you a very clear uh, answer is it can show that the past is not the past. I mean, there's of course the, the famous saying of, of Faulkner, and but I think that's one of the driving um, forces of literature because in a novel you can actually see you can show the kind of the, the persistence the perseverance the echoes of the past and how they still dominate lives and society so this is what i'm doing in my novel i mean it, it starts in 1999 and then from 1990 to 2007 going back many times uh, to 44 until until 19, uh, 89 and what i'm trying to show is that we usually construct history according to we, you know, we, we, we make it manageable by setting cutoff dates and saying that these are, you know, transformation um, dates and that things have dramatically changed and so on and so forth. But I think literature can, can take a closer look and can show actually how there's a lot of consistency and, and a lot of kind of networks and interactions and, and confluences um, that are not cut off by, by a date like 1989, but kind of persist and, and continue to influence people's lives and the society and the economy in general um, in, in many different ways. I, th I think actually a novel is a very good format to, to show that, to, to expand on that. That's actually the second question that I wanted to ask, and it's with relation to, um, so I come, I'm born in 1990, which puts me in a very interesting position in Bulgaria specifically, and I'm assuming that in Central Europe as well. Where, for example, if I'm talking with someone that's a little bit older about what it was before I was born under the communist regime, the usual response that I may get is, you don't know, I was there, you weren't. So okay, well, if it's beyond... Bad, bad response usually. It is, but it's, it's dominant. And it affects, yeah. it affects you know, uh, the people who are uh, dominant in the media, in, in the universities, these are people who are older. And so people who are my generation, they're not really allowed to talk about the past. And my kind of question is, who, who is actually allowed to speak the truth about the past? Because, I mean, if you, if you look at some of the accessible things from, like, the documents from the Politburo, there's documents that say how dangerous doing the twist dance is, how that can, like, screw up your spine, and that's actual fact, and they said it. Yet, if I write a poem about what happened before 89 without actually saying that it's me, is that less true from, from information that I may have gathered from my father and things like that. And the question, the reason why I'm asking is that, I mean, isn't that what happened in America um, all the way up to Bob Dylan? These people took things that were, really weren't theirs and they kind of represented this history and it worked. But how do you, I guess what I'm asking is how do you use something like a totalitarian past as inspiration or as muse in order to use it um, to forward it as li literature and, and mm. poetry in order to get people who have no access otherwise interested. Yeah. Well, I think I think the main problem is not generational. The main problem is that there is no free debate on the past in a country like Bulgaria. And from what I've gathered, it's the same in neighboring countries, let's say Romania, and, and all the way up to Russia, and probably worse now in Russia. Um, there is at times a simulation of a debate about the past. But um, we would have to define what would be actually a free debate. Uh, and only then could we say why are certain um, parts of, of society not 
involved in that. I think what you have to look at, and that's what my novel looks at, is um, how the Bulgarian elite has basically tried everything possible to keep the past under the lid for various reasons, which I don't think we, we need to delve into because it's too protracted. But, but that in itself has limited the, the range of the debate considerably. So you, you have a very kind of narrow discourse, um, which in itself is not prone to, to allowing kind of, especially people from a younger generation, to get involved. I mean, there, there, there are no doors to this debate. It was, for a long time, it was very regulated, very narrow. And additionally, what I already mentioned once, limited access to all the, um, to all the files. Now, the one huge problem you have, and this is, we actually had a debate in, in, in Oxford about this, the huge, with, with, a, with an Austrian historian, because I asked him how, as a historian, can you actually write about the, uh, the repressive aspect of the totalitarian past when you have two huge problems. Problem number one is you don't have complete access to the files, especially you don't have access to these files which contain evidence of criminal activity. Um, number two, even those files that you have access to, you have absolutely no sense of um, documentational um, truth. I mean, from, I've, I've read quite a number of files, and one of the interesting things is that they're full of manipulation, falsification, so on and so forth. So without you knowing the complete story, it's incredibly difficult to analyze the kind of the, the aspects of falsification. And number three is those people that um, who could give you a testimony. So if you were to um, basically um, work through you know, the instruments and, and the ways of um, oral history. Those people, most of them have died. So I was actually very fortunate because I started in the mid 90s. So from the people I've, I've interviewed, um, I think there may be two or three still alive. All the others have died. And for example, for the film, just to, to give you a sense of the urgency, for the film I did for the German television that was in 2007, I rented a bus and I could fill the whole bus. So that's about probably 60 uh, seats with people who had been, um, who'd spent several years in Belene, so that's the, the camp um, on an island in the Danube. I've seen the movie. Um, the, out of these 60 people, I don't think more than three or four are still yeah. alive today. So for, for a young person like yourself, if you were now to embark on a certain research project, your options in terms of research would be very, very limited. Um, so it's not only a question of, are you allowed to voice a different perspective. It's also a question of on what are you going to base yeah. your perspective, uh, uh, your very, very interesting perspective as someone yeah. who's born one or two generations later. Yeah. And that is, that is the huge problem. And at, at the end of the day, I think what, what the, the huge tragedy of countries like Bulgaria is, is that the, because of that, the, the, the the completely fragmented and falsified narrative of history that is perpetuated by the old and new elites will be the dominant one. There will not be enough counter, we will have a lack of counter narratives, a lack of counter history uh, to challenge them. And um, so in the end, we will have a complete victory in terms of looking at the past, a complete victory of the totalitarian regime. Yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm Honestly, I'm, I'm really, really shocked that so few pe people see that, and it's not really discussed a lot. Because I think, because nearly in a country like Bulgaria, nearly, nearly everybody is unhappy with the state yeah. of affairs. At the same time, they don't see the huge problems that uh, define this this situation with the unhappy world. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if you guys have any questions, yeah. Um, you thanks. This has been really interesting, and you mentioned uh, three sort of different types or eras of surveillance. You mentioned the kind of Soviet communist model, it's kind of very physical uh, aspect, this hyper-technological age we live in now, and also the kind of uh, in Eric Holmes' form, the kind of the, what happened in the West in the, in, the same, in the same period. And I was wondering whether you think those types of surveillance are different uh, qualitatively or just quantitatively? And if so, what is the relationship between these three, three different eras? And as a follow-on question to that, I was wondering whether you would say the rise, 
if you, if you would call it a rise of the surveillance state in the West is in a way a part of the failure to take on board the lessons of, of, of communism as part of kind of general ignorance and willing, uh, sort of <coughs> willingness to learn from, uh, you know, the sort of defeated communism in the West. Well, to answer the second part of your question yeah. first, I think one of the interesting things of the um, of the last maybe 10 to 15 years of the communist past was that in most countries, well, especially those I know well, which is East Germany and Bulgaria, um, there was actually no need for serious repression because of the individual self-censorship that was practiced by nearly every uh, person. So basically the most effective form of, of censorship, and that's the most effective form of limiting freedoms, is by voluntary kind of assignment. So if 99.9% if, if of the population basically limits what they think, speak, do, um, then you don't, I mean, that, that's the most evidently the most effective repression you possibly have. That to me seems to be repeating itself now. So that would be my, uh, to me, would be the best example of what we could have learned from, um, especially the, the last phase of um, communist totalitarian rule in regard to what's happening now, because I've noticed, and um, it's actually sometimes it's, it's, um, it's not only alluded to, it's, um, to give you one example, there was one comment in the Washington Post about maybe a year ago, and it was after this uh, pen study that, that I mentioned. And the, uh, the journalist from the Washington Post, which is, I guess, regarded as a serious newspaper, um, actually said that, well, we just have to adapt. These are technologically new times. So this might actually have a positive effect because people are not going to just talk whatever comes to their head. You know, they, they will, they will, she actually used the word, I think, um, either finesse or, or something like that, or, or um, what's it? anyway, a word like that, basically implying that maybe it's for the good that people will you know, think about what they can say in public and what they cannot say in public. Um, so in, in, in a way, this effect is, um, is I think, evident, it's, it's seen, um, but it's, um, it doesn't seem to worry too many people. First part of your question, um, one of the things that, that has shocked me most the last few months was the, the CIA, um, the, 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 the torture report by the American Congress on CAA practices. And the reason was not because of the torture that is described there. The reason was that, and I'm really not exaggerating, that in this report, there are several sentences which more or less, um, or slightly paraphrased, but very, very similar to sentences in my novel. And those were sentences, um, I'd refer to that aspect of my work, um, the rhetoric of self-justification. So these were different um, sentences, expressions that I'd heard from former officers, high-ranking officers of the Secret Service in Bulgaria, and I had gathered from their memoirs. Because one of the, the crazy things about Bulgaria is that if you were a high-ranking officer of the Secret Service, your memoirs are published by a leading publishing company, bound in leather, two volumes, thousand pages, and in the Hotel Rila, there's a wonderful um, presentation or promotion of the book. If you're a former political prisoner, it's still to this day mostly some stuff. So most of the books I have, I have a huge library at home, about 200 different titles. Most of the ones published by former political prisoners were published by themselves, like a form of kind of uh, post totalitarian some stuff. Um, so to answer your question, I, I do think that there are certain consistencies in the repress in, in the in, in, in the professional aspect of the repressive um, kind of um, uh, quotidien that are completely independent of what political system we're looking at, whether it's a so-called democracy or so-called communism or so-called whatever. Um, the, I think, for example, this argumentation, which I mentioned state security or the use of state security as a blunt instrument to basically redact any information that seems to be sensitive for whatever reasons. That is typical for all um, secret service um, 
associations, uh, institutions uh, around the world. So um, there, there seems to be so, which is why my my suggestion is actually we, we need to, if we're really serious about democracy, we need to get rid of all, all secret services because I, I don't think there's any possible democratic control of a secret service unless, of course, they're not secret in their work, but then they're no longer secret service. So they have fake secret services that you know the NSA is not the, uh, the first. Secret service that comes to mind in the, in the American system, you know, the layers upon, upon layers. Oh, yeah, they have fourteen of them. I mean, they're they're growing by numbers as we speak. Probably twenty-eight tomorrow. Any other questions? Can I throw it. <coughs> you mentioned the situation in Bulgaria that the Samizdat is still kind of the the medium for the counter voice in a sense. I mean, could you say a little bit more about this in terms of a comparison between, say, the situation in Bulgaria and, say, somewhere in Russia? Because I would have thought from what you were saying previously that actually there are a lot of similarities in terms of there's a degree of continuity, even if we just look at the economic history. I mean, you write in the, in the Dog Times book about Gazprom and uh, the sort of limited privatization ultimately that happened there, and that ultimately was just a sort of handover of resources from, you know, a very related organization to... The left hand from the, the left hand, hand to the right hand. Um, so, so there are big continuities, but it seems to me that there's a very interesting difference in terms of um, a small market of literature, say, such as the Bulgarian one, and this relatively large one still, as in the case of Russia. I, I see a sort of small advantage, possibly, in the Russian case, where there is a possibility to have a relatively large sphere still in which this kind of counter voice would, um, would emerge, because, um, I mean, there's still, it's probably going to close in the next, months or so, but yeah. at least in the past few years, there has been some kind of opening of that um, type well, of outlet. But let I don't me, know give, you, let me give you an anecdotal um, answer. That particular book was picked up by my Russian publishers, and they wanted to publish it. Um, I, I think they bought the rights. When they read the translation, because of course they, um, they just heard about it, they read the news, they, they're not, they don't understand German, so they waited for the translation. Once they read the translation, they, I don't know for what reasons, we can speculate, but they did not publish the book. I mentioned that to a certain um, Russian German a colleague of mine, and, and he said that at the moment, and this is just I think a year or two ago, so it's not much longer, he said that, especially if you're a small publishing company in Russia, there is enormous, enormous pressure can be exacted. Um, there are also all forms of kind of, um, uh, well, maybe not repression, but difficulties um, that can be, uh, that can suddenly pop up. Um, so in, in a way, the, the, the question is, which books do get published? But the bigger question is, and, and that okay, is a very interesting example, and I think Russia is, is very similar, is, who controls the media and thus are the books then truly distributed? Are they publicized? Are they discussed and so on and so forth? And um, it's from what I hear from, from, from Russian colleagues, some of this um, kind of some of these counter voices um, lead a very, very kind of limited existence in kind of small groups of, of people who have access to them. But if, if you're not in the big bookshops and you're not on TV, you're not on the radio, I mean, it's the same everywhere in the world. Um, and in Bulgaria, the one place I know really well, um, they've done a very, very good job in keeping such narratives out of the mass media. And, and the, the memoirs that I spoke of, I, hardly any one of them has received in, in a large kind of public of audience. Thank you for your wonderful insights um, before. Um, I was just interested because you mentioned that we cannot really um, envision a real democracy um, in the context of the existence of all these secret service structures and all that. I completely understand what you mean. I was, just, I was just wondering how would you then, and I know this is a very difficult question, and uh, just something on the top of your mind. Um, how would you then envision the uh, security? Because I mean, let's be frank, there are people who would overuse their freedom if they are not bound by any rules or regulations. So. We're just wondering. Yeah, well, just, just to specify, I'm not saying there shouldn't be any rules or regulations. I'm just um, saying that certain rules and regulations 
are, I think, uh, counterproductive. If we take uh, what happened since 9-11, we have a very clear, I think, um, answer to your question. We have greater and greater surveillance. We have more and more war. We have more and more state terror and, and bombing and drone attacks and so on. And uh, we are less and less secure. So if we were to just kind of um, distance ourselves from the contemporary and just analyze what happened since 9-11, one would have to, I think one would have to say that um, things are getting from bad to worse. Therefore, the mechanisms in place do not safeguard our security. They've actually worsened our security. I mean, when, when, when you look at the so-called war on terror, the situation now in the Middle East is the worst since probably ever. I mean, it's, it's so analyzing that, I would have to say it's evidently not the right way. And um, I, 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 I do think that as a society that it's supposed, uh, in which decisions are supposedly made on kind of the basis of rational thought and discussion, we would at least, we should at least do that. We should at least take, take a step back and um, kind of look, look at what has been achieved and what has not been achieved, and then discuss other possibilities of um, maybe safeguarding our security. And um, there's, a certain, there's a certain kind of automatism to this development. I think the automatism is linked to the fact that the secret services are eager to be technologically um, as powerful as possible. That they're, they're not going to voluntarily lift their technological power. Um, I think that is too much to ask of them. Also, they they live in, and that, that is very clear. That's one of the things we can learn, I think, from looking at the secret services of the communist past. When you look at the Bulgarian secret service, for example, you see that it's completely defined by paranoia, um, and it's it's at time, times absurd, it's at, at times comic, but it's throughout truly terrifying because you realize that in such a world of continuous everyday paranoia, it's absolutely impossible to have any kind of rational analysis of who is a threat and how one might deal with such threats. And and to, from what I've heard and read and so on, I, I think that's very, very true of all secret services. So would you really entrust your safety to an organization or to an apparatus that is to a large extent defined by paranoia? Well, I don't know about paranoia, but the thing is, because um, you mentioned the Middle East and the Arab Spring, as I, um, I was just um, wondering, because um, the Arab Spring and all those killings were done by militia or whatever groups we, we might call them, they did take advantage of this progress towards freedom, or the narrative towards freedom anyway. So, and before, let's say, 10 years, so all those dictatorships, although there were dictatorships, people didn't die under those dictatorships, right? Well, people no. weren't slaughtered. Well, well, since you asked me, right, I have to say, no, that's not true. I mean, for example, a country I spent quite a while in was Syria. Uh, for example, the city of Homs and the, the, the violence that happened in the city of Homs is a result of a traumatization. In the early 80s, Assad basically leveled the city and killed 40,000 people. So the, and these are things. This yeah, one I of mean, the, there are examples, of course. But I, I, think, mean, I think there are many examples. You had in all these countries. You had. I mean, it's very similar to what I'm looking at in Bulgaria. It's the same structure. You have a traumatized society, traumatized by violence, repression, lack of freedom, and so on. So of course, once you change that particular very, um, very kind of rigid system. Of course, all sorts of things start happening. So, you, of course, you have also explosions of violence, and, and you have conflicts and, and revenge, and, and so on and so forth. But I, I think it would be difficult to claim that this is not a direct result of years and decades of the, uh, either dictatorships or totalitarian regimes. I do think that's a direct, and, and, and it's very, very difficult, from what I understand of history, it's very, very difficult to overcome um, kind of a, a culture and the reality of violence um, and, 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 and of, of repression. I mean, that, that takes a long time. And one, of, one, of the, one of the things, one of the scenes in my novel, which is actually based on something I experienced, was there were these big demonstrations in Bulgaria, um, oh, the year you were born, for example, uh, 
I was there on, on uh, several occasions. And I remember speaking to, to a young Bulgarian who said that, um, well, you know, things are going to change now. And I said, well, do, do you think they're going to change quickly? And he said, yeah, I mean, a few weeks, a few months. And I said, yeah, maybe you're a bit too optimistic. Maybe it's going to take on. Oh, I can't, I'm young. I can't wait for uh, longer. You know, if, if, it, if they don't change within a year, whatever, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm leaving Bulgaria. And uh, he then invited me home. And we went um, to, his, to his apartment. He, and as most Bulgarians, he was living with his extended, extended family. So um, we met his, his grandmother. And his grandmother looked at him and with the great wisdom of age said, this is going to take at least 50 years. And he looked at her as if she was, you know, the craziest person on the planet. And he probably thought, you know, sclerotic old woman, what do you know? Now, if you talk to people um, and you tell them it's going to really change for the best in 50 years, they would say, wow, that's optimistic. Yeah, I would take that if you take. That's just another 25 years. So, so you, I, I think we are... And one of the things which interests me as an author is to, to actually fathom the depth of destruction and traumatization to actually see a way out of it. So, so you're very right in saying that the, the aspect of redemption or the aspect of solution has to be always in our mind. So, I mean, we, sh we should not, both in criticism and analysis, we should not be kind of not confide ourselves in, in just looking at what happened, but we should kind of project that into a form of redemption and, and solution. So, so I think that is also something that novel writing or fiction can do better than, than probably a scientific book. Yes. Uh, I was born in Bulgaria in the 70s, and I remember that in the 80s, um, I was very fascinated with this book. At that time, actually, a bit later in the 90s, I started reading Kukushinsky, uh, and I was very fascinated by his trips to uh, the so called third, third world countries. Later, I discovered you, and I was also fascinated by the fact that you were born in Bulgaria. I know you were familiar with Africa and with all these other countries that you were fascinated with. I've been always fascinated. I have been always fascinated by it. I wonder, I wonder to what extent your new book is going to be understood uh, by people living outside Europe and North America, people you have met in various countries around the world, and what is now going on in this country, because you were talking about issues that are of. Um, um, they are, in my view, they are important for Europe with the technological um, development in North America. But I wonder how people in Africa, how people in India um, think of these issues now. How the presentation of your book in this part of the world is going to look well, let me start um, with looking at India, because um, I, I lived for six years in India, and I still have very close contacts. Um, India is very interesting in the context of our, of our discussion, because in India you have um, basically the past and the contemporary <coughs> side by side. So you have in the big cities, you have a highly technological, um, urban, young elite, so in Bangalore, Bombay, Delhi, Hyderabad and so on. So, so they would be extremely competent and knowledgeable. Um, as you know, it's um, a lot of the software is, is developed in, in places like Bombay and Bangalore. So any form of control, surveillance there would be probably, um, I mean, I haven't look, looked into it, but I'm quite sure it would be on the same technological advanced level as it is in North America and Europe. So you'd have that aspect. But at the same time, in, in rural India, you would um, actually have um, forms of repression that are probably very, very similar to, to, to the old kind of classical physical forms that, um, that existed a few um, decades ago. Um, so the, that, that's a very interesting 
very interesting question as to, of course, books like that I only read by this, this urban elite. So I'm, I'm guessing they could, they could relate to that. Speaking of, of Africa, whenever I go back to Africa, one of the, the truly fascinating things is that um, you know that there's this myth that nothing works in Africa, it's a lost continent, so, so, so and so forth. But then you see certain niches of um, incredibly accelerated development, niches of excellence. And one of them, for example, is the mobile phones. So I hadn't been there for a few years. I went back and suddenly everybody in East Africa had a mobile phone. I mean, absolutely everybody. You would pass by gardeners, and, you know, they would take out their mobile phone on the market. And there were people selling just on, on one square meter, selling a few vegetables and potatoes would have a mobile phone. So, but at the same time, most of these um, societies are, are far from being democracies. I mean, many of them are a mix of kind of ben, what they call benevolent dictatorships and stuff like that. It's wonderful, by the way, how they come up with all these different uh, expressions for, for lack of freedom. So anyway, so in a benevolent democracy, um, like for example, Tanzania, you have a population that meanwhile is um, to a large extent, probably similar to Europe, using mobile phones. So they would have to, but at the same time you have, and until recently, I mean, Tanzania had actually more political prisoners than, uh, than South Africa during apartheid. So, so again, you see you have both, you have both levels um, coexisting. You have uh, very traditionally repressive systems and new technology seeping in. And at the same time, of course, many of these states are regarded uh, by the United States as um, natural allies, so very true for Kenya, for example, in opposition to Somalia and Sudan. So I'm sure that they, they, they receive a lot of technological aid also by the Secret Service. So, so I, I, I think um, I think one of the interesting things about Kapuczynski is to, to link up with uh, what you said at the beginning, is that Kapuczynski basically projected communist reality onto Africa. He went to Angola, he went to Ethiopia, he had a certain vision of a fossilized political system at home. He was not allowed to critically uh, write about that system. So basically what he did is he came up with a slightly fictionalized understanding of Africa that mirrored his worries or his understanding of, of the Polish system, which is how you end up with a book like the one on Haile Selassie, where um, actually what he describes at the court of Haile Selassie is closer to the political role in also than to what was actually happening in Addis Ababa. Um, so that, that, that is a very, very interesting, again, a blurring of lines between fiction and non-fiction, which is why there's a huge discussion amongst authors as to what Kapuczynski actually did and their proponents and their opponents and so on. But um, I think that, 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 that would be very, very interesting to, to actually have someone from Africa write about a reality that is now opening up the kind of the, the global technological explosion of, of surveillance and, and the repression, while still firmly rooted in a, in a very kind of rural and, and old fashioned uh, system. That, that would be actually a brilliant idea for a novel I to, I to tell something <laughs> African country. Maybe a final question? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm relaxed. If there is a final to... question. I mean, you were starting to answer, and I think you've alluded to the answer, was about the relationship between surveillance and democracy. Um, because I know in this country, for instance, which you could make the argument that it's, I mean, you, you talk about trauma as well, and like historical trauma. I mean, uh, whenever there's a poll about whether people want security cameras, it always comes up overwhelmingly in favor of, yes, we want security cameras. I don't know about in Bulgaria, but I'm pretty sure in the Soviet Union, in the Brezhnev era, if there'd been a chance to vote freely and fairly, people would have voted for this. And so, so again, Bob Barthes said, you know, who wrote four million uh, denouncements of everyone else? There's complicity in the system. And sure. how do you fight that aspect of it? I mean, is that, how do you stop the fact that people would vote for these measures if they could with their freedom? Well, resistance is a very difficult uh, occupation. <laughs> and there's the, there, there are no shortcuts to successful resistance. I mean, it's just on many, many different levels. I mean, um, of course, critical thought, um, subversion, um, narratives, um, a, a language of, um, of protest, um, symbols, um, I mean, it's, it's a huge topic, um, but it's, but it's very, very difficult. I'm, I'm often 
my, 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 not very encouraged by exactly what you just described that as much as one tries to argue the problem is not only that they would vote for more surveillance the problem is that they they would um justify it in, in, um, in a very troubling way um, they actually seem to believe the kind of the, the, the rhetoric uh, the rhetorics of power they, they seem to take that you know, when, when, for example one very very good example is um after the attack in Paris on Charlie Hebdo, the, there's been an ongoing argument in the European Union as to whether we should, um, whether the, the different states to uh, a law that is, um, this framework is defined by the European Union in Brussels, uh, should collect um, metadata and keep it for either half a year or one year. So whether the data collected by phone companies, for example, should generally be stored for a certain period of time usually the, um, the period of time discussed is either half a year or one year uh, it was in, the law was introduced in germany and the supreme court uh, said that it's not constitutional um, so immediately after the attacks nearly everybody in, in germany who wants to push that particular law said you see we need that law. although it is clear to anybody who is reasonably versed with both the administrative legal and technical side of this question is that uh, collecting metadata can only be helpful in then solving the crime. It has absolutely no re relevance whatsoever to uh, preventing the crime. It is not an instrument of prevention. It does help, fair enough, it does help afterwards. But in this case, that was not necessary at all. And what is particularly um, kind of false or man manipulative in this case is that France was actually the one state which, which had this um, metadata collection for a number of years, like that, quite a number of years, three, four, five years. So the fact, that actually, the, the case in Paris proved the opposite that even if you have had have, have this particular law, it does not prevent attacks like that from happening, which is evident. I think it's a question of kind of emotional. Um, manipulation. I think what would have to happen is you would have to, as a politician, you would have to tell the public there is no way to prevent a suicide attack. There is no way. There's absolutely nothing. Even if we introduced complete and utter surveillance of everybody, even if we could, you know, kind of have um, the transparent citizen from A to Z, we could still not prevent it. But that is, of course, not opportune. I mean, that's not something any politician could could say, and therefore they, they come up with these um, kind of manipulations and falsifications. And the troubling thing is that, I, I, I think we, to me the troubling thing is that we we assume, or I, I amongst many people used to assume that just because we have something which calls itself democracy, there is a profound interest amongst the citizens in the values of this democracy, that actually freedom, for example, is something which people care about. Uh, when I was when I was young, I, I, I really thought that. I really believed that. I thought that freedom, my my kind of strong interest or my my strong kind of emotional connection to the value of freedom, that it, that was shared by by a majority. And I've now realised that that is not true. That actually, what you said is completely uh, true. That actually most people could easily just throw it away and, and would really care much which just shows that one thing which we were never taught, not at school and not in university and not in the public discourse, is that there is no legal defense of democracy. There is only a continuous fight for democracy in each and every generation. So we cannot establish democracy and then safeguard it. We can only re-establish it by active individuals, politically active, um, critical individuals, time and again, year after year, generation after generation. And at the moment we have this lethargy, people just kind of leaning back and saying, yeah, nothing bad will happen. You know, we have some rules and regulations. I vaguely heard something about freedom and rights and democracy, so I'm okay. I don't think that will happen to me. That, I think that is, that is fatal because that will, that, that's a kind of, um, yeah, that's um, the wrong attitude and that will lead to this particular development, I think, getting worse. 
I don't think that democracy ever existed. We just uh, always see methods of power that just make it fine. Maybe the question is naive. I was just thinking something you were saying that that there was just well the technology just yeah, sure. I mean, there's 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 always power. I I, I do think that um, in qualitative terms, there are successful restrictions of power and less successful. So I, I do think that, for example, looking at at Germany after the Second World War, that there was a system set up in which, because of the federal structure, because of the the power of the constitution, because of the influence of the constitutional court, and so on and so forth, you did actually have a balance of powers and you did have um, checks and regulations that to a certain extent at least kind of let's say safeguarded us from, from the excesses of power let's put it that way yeah just to give one example yeah i think that that was a reasonably in terms of maybe it was just an artifact of these times of building and making everything great That's true. I would agree with you, but I mean, I'm just pointing out that it's possible to have at least a better system. If not a, I would agree with you that would not be a, a democracy in, in radical terms. And I agree with you, but it would at least be. It could be much, much better. I mean, one of the problems I have in the, in the, in the current political discussion is that there seems to be no middle ground. I mean, people either say that, you know, this is the end of it. It's very, very. Um, I don't know about. England, but in Germany, it's very, very fashionable now to speak of post-democracy and to speak of it as if we've missed a train. So, you know, it's too late to do anything about it. So I'm, people like myself are basically regarded as naive nitwits because we do not understand what any intellectual worth his soul sh should understand is that if the train has left the station, you shouldn't be saying, you know, I want to catch the train. Um, so this kind of this kind of post democracy movement is implying that in any case, and it, it, it links up with a very strong movement now, which is called post privacy movement, which works on the same kind of logical, has the same logical framework, which is that because of the technological development, privacy of it is a thing of the past. So to insist on privacy is basically to be as nonsensical as the Luddites who would destroy machines just to prevent industrialization. So so these two movements are now amongst so-called political intellectuals are, are very strong, which which leads to basically a shrugging of the shoulders and saying, you know, take it on the chin and move on. We had a few good days of democracy and uh, now it's over, which to me is slightly kind of, I don't know, <laughs> um, which is why I'm looking back at what happened in Bulgaria during communist times, because I'm, I'm thinking this, um, I think that there's there are very good reasons to avoid things things like that happening again. I think uh, one shouldn't give up yet. I'm in Bulgaria myself, and I like all the articles and the uh, reportages, and I find so which, many. Which which ones? The, the essays. The essays, so the reportage or yeah. the reportage. And it was very a lot of parallels you could make to prison situation, thinking of the way things were the fifties and the sixties. I'm sure. It's very striking. Can I just make one small thing, a point in con um, connection to this? I mean, I just thought um, from some way uh, earlier in the conversation, you mentioned the kind of ethics of plots in some ways. That there, there are certain taboo subjects that the kind of current media consensus uh, kind of prevents from being established. And in some ways, one could see your interventions as being kind of breaking those taboos and intervening in our plot constructions of um, how these things connect. To the present in a way in the past. And I mean, to what extent is there a sense that I mean that this is something that you would um, I don't know encourage people to do in different domains of working with the past, like opening up different plots in the sense of um, well, can, I mean, for example, I mean, thinking about the recent uh, situation, like the, the suicide um, airline disaster, right, and then se separately the Boston bombings. The, the standard plots would be to say the Boston bombings are a story of Islamic radicalization and terrorism. The suicide story is just a story of suicide and uh, needs to be treated as a history of depressive episodes in public transport or something. Um, so 
would it be possible to say that actually if one follows a kind of different method of employment in the sense that actually actually that neither is in some ways plausible that actually we need to have a kind of more open-minded idea of how we plot events that connect with our fears of insecurities and if we have this more open mind then we will kind of stop looking at this many key and idea of like socialist versus post-socialist or democratic versus post-democratic thing is there a sense that we can i mean the method in some ways <laughs> Is that kind of method yeah. of imagination that opens up yeah, but what connections you're, through important in a different what, way? What you're suggesting is, is not practical in, in a massive degree, uh, for many, mm -hmm. many reasons. Um, for anyone who's worked in mass media that um, knows that there's so many there's so many limits to how you can approach a subject, to the language you can use, um, to the perspective you can take, to the claims you can make. I mean, just to start off with the most evident that if you were to make such a seemingly radical claim as you just suggested, you would have to prove it. And the burden of proof would be much, much higher than if you said something completely idiotic, which is through repetition has become a truism, like the problems in the Islamic world are because of the age old conflict between Shia and Sunni. Now, to anybody who knows the Islamic world, this is nonsense by excellence, but because it's repeated continuously, you, you know, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to prove that. So time and again, I read it every day in the newspaper. That's okay. Now, to make that kind of new, to, 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 to plot it out in a different way, in a radically new way, you, they would have to allow you, they would have to give you a lot of space, first of all. They would have to allow you to use your own language, and your own, to develop the story, the narrative in your own way. And that is close to impossible to do. It's close to impossible. I mean, there are one or two people who can do it. I mean, very famous example is someone like Gigi, but they're allowed to do it according to me because they've been kind of chosen as um, the one kind of errant, radical, jester. crazy court jester who's allowed to say anything, and then he's allowed to kind of you know juggle with all sorts of bizarre uh, balls and, and, and come up with the, with the craziest of uh, suggestions, but. Um, Otherwise, um, it's, it's really very, 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 very difficult. And, um, so, so that is another reason why I prefer to write books. You have far more reason. Just in terms of the, of the individual freedom, you have far, far more leeway when you're writing a book than when you're um, writing for, for mass media. One last thing, and then we, we can close. And I don't know whether you'd be up for a beer after this or not, but we can we can figure that out. Never too tired for a beer. But, with regards to the mass media and what you said about democracy, well, I, I, I work for uh, Al Jazeera and specifically a platform called AJ Plus, which is mostly videos and tweets, and it's directly related to people who are the so-called millennial generation, so people who are coming of age right now. And even though you're absolutely right in terms of the restrictions and framework and, and guidelines of what is editorially acceptable to be published, even as a tweet, which is uh, a sentence, that is true. But what I am noticing is that what is forming is a is a kind of democratic discourse that goes beyond the nation state in the sense that people who are young are, are talking to each other and and there's a space there's a public space which is really the kind of the, the very ancient greek idea of of public speaking and what whereas some people assume that you know cats or, or memes or these kind of like funky things are just like internet fads actually they're not like they're actually it, it creates a possibility of people to reach each other throughout the world and what I see from, from behind in terms of looking at statistics at how people are interacting is by, you know, pushing something forward that's a little bit funny or whatever, that actually makes people engaged and then they start talking about South Carolina or Lufthansa. And, the, and the, within three months, the conversation changes after Charlie Hebdo, where it's like, until you have absolute proof, don't say that it's like an Islamic attack, to when the plane happened it was we're not saying anything about terrorism attack and i can see that like very democratic very pluralistic discourse shaping and even though i absolutely agree with you in terms of the book giving the freeway um i think as easy as it is to say that the times that we live in now are quite brutal and habesian where every, everything is like i also see as, as a great opportunity where if if we actually manage to take this disempowerment that the, the phone gives you, you can 
you, you can actually develop the citizen-led counter initiative just because everybody else is doing it. Mm. I agree with you, but that is exactly why they're trying everything possible to control these uh, social media um, operators. I think that is one of the main reasons if, if we were to start a new conversation as to why there is this trend towards all encompassing surveillance. I think one of the main reasons is exactly that. There is a certain fear of the um, democratic power and eruptive power of social media in all these aspects that you described. And that's why a lot is done to, um, to control them. And uh, the, uh, I think we need to have a very serious discussion as to why these companies are so eagerly, uh, so, so easily manipulated by uh, by the NSA, for example, or by other uh, institutions in the state. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. Um, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And now the beer.